this? Uh, Your Honor, uh, we are going to be relying on the exact same witnesses that the prosecution has already presented to the jury, so we will not be calling uh, any further witnesses of the prosecutor. They were already on our witness list as well, and uh, therefore the defense would be resting at this time as well. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, I gotta begin by thanking you. You have been an extremely attentive group. Didn't see anybody nodding off the whole four days of trial, so we do appreciate that. You're taking it seriously, and we know that. Now is my opportunity in the closing statement to go over the evidence, the evidence that was presented. Now, obviously, what I'm telling you now is not evidence, but it's my comments on the evidence. I want to cause you to think about the evidence that could decide whether the... Uh, proofs have shown that this man, Mr. Olson, is guilty of the crime that he's charged with. So look at it this way. You've heard a lot of testimony. Consider that pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. Now it's up to you to put those pieces together and decide what the big picture was, to decide what happens, to decide if the proofs establish the guilt of the defendant. That's your job now. My job, defense attorney's job, present the evidence. You decide what that evidence means. You consider that evidence. And now is my opportunity to talk about that evidence. There are a lot of puzzles here for you to put together. The reason, reason out. Look at it. Now, there are some things that are just beyond dispute. There's no arguments about it. Yong Chang, an elderly man, went out hunting on November 16th, 2018, in the evening of hunting. After work, he went out to the Rose Lake area to go hunting. His family becomes concerned because they don't, he doesn't come home when they expect him to come home. He doesn't come home right after dark. He went out hunting, he doesn't come home, there is concern. His wife is very concerned about him. So she has other relatives go out on a search party. She calls around. And what we have is a number of his relatives, a number of his family members, a number of people who care about Chong Yang going out there to Rose Lake and looking for him. They know or at least some of them do, that you know he hunts in that area. So this is a good place to go look for him. And they go out and they start searching. And lo, unfortunately, they find him. They find him laying face down in the woods. Now they approach him as any reasonable person would when they see somebody down there, they're determined to to find out, is he still alive? Is he okay? What has happened? And they get around him. And as a result, there are footprints everywhere around his body. But they don't go beyond a log in the top. And very interestingly, as the police respond, they see footprints going off in the north and then around back to the main path. At that point in time, that's the only clue, the footprint going up from the murder scene, around and down to the main path. A very solid clue, a very important clue. In fact, the only clue at that point. They see Mr., as they respond, they see Mr. Yang sitting there with, laying there face down, dressed like a hunter with an orange vest pulled up, camo, wearing camouflage fatigues, but no gun. And they learned from the family that he routinely carries a traditional Hmong knife and no knife. That's the evidence. The reasonable evidence is the gun was taken. 
You don't go out into the woods wearing hunting gear without a gun. The clues at the scene, man laying face down, no gun, no knife, but a battery right by his head, a battery that would fit in a headlamp and a flashlight under his body when they move his body that's still on. From that, you can reasonably infer that he had that flashlight on at the time he was shot and fell on top of it. And that somehow that headlamp was taken, just as the rifle was taken. Now looking at the scene, he's laying face down. There's no way to tell what position he was in at the time he was shot. You heard that from the medical examiner. She can tell you the way the bullet passed if the person's in the anatomical position, standing straight up looking ahead. Standing straight up looking ahead, the bullet goes in the left, comes out the left eye. But we don't, and slightly upward, but we don't know what if his head was straight up or if it was bent or if it was, so the, the wounds really tell us nothing about how he was shot. Because we don't know what position he was standing in at the time he was shot. So, what they have now, missing, missing articles, clearly missing articles, footprints that go around. But not only go around, those same footprints <clears throat> go from the body up to a log and back. What's the significance of that? Well, think about it. Perhaps the gun was on the log. Perhaps some of the items were on the log. Is there any other explanation as to why those footprints went up to the log? Was Mr. Yang holding his gun? Was it on the side? Was it the back? We don't know. There's no way of telling. But there's a reasonable inference here about those footprints going up to that log and then coming back is that that rifle was laying on that log and was taken. <coughs> Didn't even have to go nearer. Take him <clears throat> from the log, not from the body. All right, now the police have one clue here, one big clue here. <laughs> they, they have one big clue here. They've got that tread pattern, the boot print going around. Well, the first thing they do is to compare at the scene. And they find that that boot print has a tread pattern that matches Mang Yang, the nephew of the deceased. So they have a suspect right away. He's got a, he's wearing boots that have the same tread pattern as that tread going off into the woods and down to the main path. They execute search warrants. He's a suspect as much as they dislike that fact. They look at everything and they very soon clear him. That tread is a very, very popular boot tread. And then, in fact, when they go to Meng's house, they find all kinds of boots with that same pattern. So now they've got that pattern. That's all they have. They broadcast this. They go to the media. They put out anybody who has any information. Come and let us know. No tip is too wild. We'll look at everything. Tell us what you, you know, you know or any, even suspect, and we'll check it out. And while they're doing all that, they're doing their best. They're doing their best to figure out that tread path. And what they find out is that tread path goes up, around, and back to the main path. And then, somewhere down the main path, it goes off to the, to the west. 
just goes off to the west by itself, nowhere else in the snow. And at the end of the path where it goes off is this bag. The officers first think it's just garbage somebody threw there. The guy who has this tread pattern walked back there and dropped it, just discarded it. Well, that's a clue. They got a, they open up the bag and there's a deer scent in it. Okay. At that point in time, well, the rifle's missing. The headlight is missing. The knife is missing. Perhaps this was taken from Mr. Yang. Perhaps it's his deer spray. Perhaps the person who shot him came around and walked off that path and dropped it, inadvertently dropped it, and then went back to the main path. So what they do then is take that and send it to the lab. Yeah, let's see, is that Mr. Yang? Did somebody steal that from him too? And at that point in time, you heard the DNA expert. They can only compare it if they have a known sample from someone. They had a known sample from Mr. Yang. That was not his DNA on that spray, on that bag. So they're, again, a dead end. Things keep going into dead ends, but they keep trying. They go forward. Still, the looming question about the tread pattern on the boot. The looming question here, tread pattern on the boot. Because obviously that's a very important piece of evidence. It goes up from the body, around, back to the main path, and right down to the end, where the bag and the deer spray is discarded. Remember the testimony of the officer? That's where he found it. One set of prints coming from the main path, coming in, and they were that same tread pattern as the one by Mr. Yang's body. So now they do everything to try to identify that tread pattern. They know it's a very popular tread pattern. They know that when they did the execution of the search warrant at Meng Yang's house, and everybody had them. They started looking and checking with, with uh, manufacturers, checking with the FBI, trying to find out you know, as much as they can about that tread pattern. And they find it's a very popular tread pattern. It's on an awful lot of different boots, different model boots. That same tread pattern, okay. not helpful. They still cannot connect those tread pads to an individual. But then the whole tone of the investigation changes. It changes because of the world we live in and the devices we carry. This case could only be solved because because of the cell phone and cell phone data. But what do they do? What do the police do? They check with the cell phone. They check with Google. They check with Apple. They're looking for a hit. They're looking for a device that was in the area of Rose Lake at the time Mr. Yang was killed. Now they put out through the media, through posters, the need to help. And citizens come forward, and you heard a citizen here who told us about the shot that he heard at 6 o'clock on November 16, 2018. So they've got a time frame now to deal with. 6 o'clock. So you want to go couple hours before, you go a couple hours after, and you get records from Google, from Apple. What devices were in that area at that time? And lo and behold, they get a hit. They got a couple of them. And they check them out because that's where the shoe leather comes in. That's where the, the good police work. 
working, working, working these clues, going out and interviewing people, getting records, checking everything that you can to find the answer. And when they identify, lo and behold, when they finally identify Mr. Olson, this is like a year and a half after the crime. The first time they ever hear his name. We never hear about Mr. Olson coming forward saying, I was out there that day and I, I didn't hear anything or I didn't do anything. No, we never heard him come forward. Now he obviously knew about the, the, the shooting and you can tell that from the, the photos that were taken from his phone. He's taking pictures of the, uh, uh, the, one, the uh, reward posters out there. You can look at people's exhibit number one. Number one, that reward poster. He's, he's, he's got a lot of interest in this case. He's taking pictures of the reward poster. He's taking a lot of pictures. He's taking a lot of communication on his cell phone. Now, through the search warrants, they were able to plot where he was at at various times, and you're going to see that in the uh, defense exhibit, where they plotted every time there was a hit on his device in Rose Lake, you know, from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. You can see that he walked right into the to the game area, walked right around to where the victim was, and then there is a gap, a gap for 13 minutes from 60, I think it was 609 or thereabouts, a gap, a gap with plenty of time for him to go a little further north and come back, but you can see how he charts He's there, there's no question. Now, the evidence is that his phone was there, his device was there, but use reason, experience, and common sense. Doesn't that mean he was there? Doesn't that mean he was there? Now, you still have a question. He cannot be linked to those boots, that boot print. He has not been linked to the boot print. How do they try? And they try. You'll have people's exhibit number one back there. You'll see on his phone one of the uh, many, and I'm going to call this the frat boy humor that you will see for Mr. Olson. The way, I mean, he's not a, a, you know, a, a card carrying uh, Nazi uh, sympathizer. He's not. But he has that, uh, you know, clearly the, the, the white supremacist uh, leaning that you will see and joking about it, but it's there, it's clearly there. Now, look at this and consider this. On his phone, a picture sent from Rod Rodway. Craig sent me this, this time morning, T-H-A-I, time morning. What's the why do I, what's time? Perhaps a reference to Mong? You decide. But what does it say in there? How does Mr. Olson respond? Mr. Olson responds, a couple of cold-blooded killers revisiting the crime scene. That's how Mr. Olson responds to that picture. Well, interestingly, that picture shows him there in, you know, his full hunting gear along with a boot, shows a boot. So the officers, good police work, you follow every lead, they take a picture, or they blow up the picture that's there, and they try to use that photograph to see if they can identify to that tread pattern. So at the time, the couple of cold-blooded build, cold, blooded killers revisited the crime scene, he was wearing certain boots. That doesn't mean he was wearing the same boots at the time he committed the murder, but what he says, 
a couple of cold-blooded killers revisiting the crime scene, revisiting, coming back, revisiting. Those are the boots that he's wearing as he is revisiting, not as the time that he's doing the killing. It's the time he's revisiting. So they get that picture, they send it to the FBI, they do everything in the world because they just have uppers. And they want to see, are there any, any boots that have uppers like this that would have the pattern that we're looking for in the uh, ones, the tread pattern that goes from the murder scene to the main path. So the FBI can't, you know, FBI says it just doesn't match any we have. So the boots that he wore when he revisited the crime scene you know, in his own words, a couple of kill, cold-blooded killers revisiting the crime scene. He doesn't say, this is what I was wearing at the time that I killed or shot Mr. Yang. He says, this is what, uh, you know, the, this is what uh, the photo is me revisiting the crime scene. And they look at those uh, boots and they do everything they can to try and, and they just don't match. So the boots that he's wearing when he revisited the crime scene were not those with the tread pattern. That's, you're gonna see all that from the FBI, you're gonna see all that. But the main question then becomes, where are the boots that he wore at six o'clock on November 18th of 2018? Now nobody even hears about Mr. Olson for two, you know, almost two years until you know, his device comes back. He never volunteers anything. He never comes down and says, uh, hey, I, I, you know, I was out there and, uh, um, oh, yeah, somebody borrowed my DNA so they could go down there and, and, and frame me and put it on that deer scent. You know? And uh, I didn't know why he was coming and ask me why somebody was borrowing my DNA. Well, nobody borrowed his DNA. His DNA was on that spray that was found at the end of the path that goes off the main path, out there by itself, out and back. Now remember, at the time, the rifle's missing, the knife is missing, other things are missing, a bag from Mr. Young. You can't carry everything out. Something's going to drop. I mean, you're carrying your own rifle and his rifle and the bag and the knife and the deer scent Something's going to fall off. And that's what happened. He went back into that wood off the trail to try to figure out what he was going to do. What was the next step? What was happening? Look at that chart that's in evidence showing the times, showing the you know, GPS moving right through Rose Lake. He's got to figure out what he's going to do with this stuff. He's got to figure out what to do. And it drops. And there can be no question that it is his DNA on that deer spray, not Mr. Yang's. The police first thought it was Mr. Yang's. It was taken from him. No, it wasn't. It was Mr. Olson's all the way through. Now, when you look through and you see all his comments and all his interest in the case and all his awareness of the case, why in the world doesn't he go to the police? Why in the world? He certainly knows about Mr. Yang being, he has the poster here, the, uh, the reward poster. He takes a picture of it. Isn't that odd? Isn't that odd? When you look at the totality of the shots on his phone, now, what does the evidence show? Put those pieces together. Use reason, experience, and common sense. Okay. That boot path was made by Mr. Olson. We cannot and nobody has been able to 
match a pair of boots that have that print to Mr. Olson. Just can't do it. But what we do know, what we do know is when that cold-blooded killer revisited the crime scene, he was wearing a pair of shoes that did not match. Now why do we believe that it was Mr. How have we proven that it was Mr. Olson with those treads? Because the treads go to one place, off to the west of the main trail, and then back onto the main trail. No other treads around, no other footprints around. One footprint, and at the end of that trail, a bag with deer scent with Mr. Olson's DNA. Not just maybe he had something to do with it. It's this soul path walking back to the area. Find the, the deer spray. Clearly, his DNA. So, why did he kill him? I don't know. I don't have to prove a motive. I don't think we can here. The thing that can be said is when you look at his emails and his search records, you see the, what I'll have to call the frat boy sense of humor. Make a big joke about everything. Make a big joke about minorities. Make a big joke about the, 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 the supremacy of the white guy. You know, why do we let other people out here to hunt? This is for the white people. Okay, you see that kind of joking. Now, again, you know, I, I'm not inferring that, he, that he's, you know, a Nazi supremacist going out there to shoot uh, all Asians. No, but it just shows this mentality here. It shows this frat boy joking, the frat boy mentality. It is not inconsistent with firing a gun over the top of somebody's head for the purpose of scaring them. It's not, it's not inconsistent with that. Look at these statements. Look at that, consider that. I'm not gonna sit here in good conscience and say he went out and shot because he doesn't like Asians. I'm not gonna say that. But what I am gonna say is that there is a reasonable inference here that he intended to create a high risk of death or great bodily harm with knowledge that great bodily harm is a probable result of your action because he fired that gun at, in the direction of, Mr. Yang. And how can I say that? Because of the tread traps that go around, because <clears throat> of the DNA that was found there at the scene, because the GPS plotting that shows him right there within firing distance of Mr. Yang. <coughs> That's the way I see the evidence. It'll be up to you to decide if you think there is an evidence of an intent to kill. I don't think it's there. I don't think there's an intent to kill. I don't think there's an intent to do great bodily harm. I think that the evidence shows, and the reasonable inference that's coming from the evidence, is that there was an intent to create this high risk of death or great bodily harm because he's going to be, with his frat humor, scare the devil out of this little Chinaman. Boom. That's what he's all about. And we think he was more surprised than ever. Was it an accident? Of course it not wasn't an accident. If it was an accident, you would have heard a 911 call. Hey, my gun went off accidentally. What do we hear from the medical examiner? It was intentionally fired classify this as a homicide. <coughs> We're not talking about an accident here. <coughs> We're talking about intentionally firing in a certain direction, creating a high risk of death or great bodily harm. Uh, depraved indifference is a term we often use. <coughs> I just don't care. He's just a chineman. He's just a chink, as he calls it. Yeah, I'll scare the devil on This is going to be great. Great fun to go and tell my frat boys. Hey, I scared the devil out of this guy. He's out there. I can see him. He's wearing this headlamp. He's got his flashlight. He's a pretty easy target. Yeah, I'll just shoot him above, head, above his head. I'll knock a branch off. 
<coughs> that's not what happened. Now you heard a little bit of testimony here. <coughs> uh, a misdirection, misdirection. Because everything points to Mr. Olson here. The DNA, the tracking from the GPS, everything points to him. But what do we hear? <coughs> a misdirection towards somebody named Jack Coon. <coughs> well, please consider Mr. Coon a suspect. And they do the same thing they do with every suspect. They do their best to find out the truth. And in this case, they find out through the records and the interviews that he worked till 4.30, that he went to a gas station and bought some gas, that he then <coughs> made several calls to his wife, which they listened to. They then send in the text between him and his wife during this period. Right? So he's texting his wife. He's following, they get uh, records from Apple, and they follow him. They follow him, and he's not inside the park. He doesn't go to the park. And interestingly, we have a detective, uh, Lasher tells us, you know, it's a, from where the body was found, it is 1,800 plus steps back into the woods. The entire day of November 16th, the entire day of November 16th, Jack Coon only had 1,300 steps on his device. 1,300 steps. Not even enough to get back to where it was. Plus, he was not hunting that day. Now, you were misdirected. You were told about uh, a text message between him and his wife and it was originally a representative that he said he was going to go hunting. He did. Look at that text message. It's in evidence. You can see very clearly he's talking about he couldn't collect some money because he is going, not me, he is going up north and hunting that evening. He, not I, he. There is no admission here by Jack Coon that he's going hunting. There is no evidence that ties Jack Coon to this case. A misdirection. A misdirection. Look at the evidence. Look at those hard, hard evidence. The GPS listing. We show him going around. The footprints that go from the body off the top back to the main trail and then out to the area of the bag and the deer spray. How does that bag and deer spray get there at the end of the trail, the end of the trail of this tread path? Only one way. It was carried back there. It was carried back there by the killer. And who carried that back there? Well, the DNA says, the science says, it was Thomas Olson. The science says. Now, clearly, you can always just pull out a, a Ouija board, or at times they you know, will put people in a dunk tank. And if they sank, they were guilty. And if they floated, they were innocent. But you've got an obligation here to Make your decision based on the evidence and look at that hard evidence. The GPS, the gap of 12 minutes right up there by the body. You will see that gap of 12 minutes. You will see him coming back. You will see him driving off. You will see subsequent searches. Now, a couple of cold-blooded Killers revisiting the time, the crime scene. When he revisited the crime scene, he wasn't wearing the boots and made that tread. Clearly, he was not. But look at his search history. Right after the incident, he has a lot of interest in Bath Township. He's doing searches for information about Bath Township. And then he does searches for boots. For boots. You can see those boots. Why would you uh, do a search for boots if you've already got a good pair? 
so that you can have a new pair when you revisit the crime, the crime scene? A pair that would not link you to the crime? Now, there, the prince, as much as we wanted to find something that would match up, we can't. There are a lot of people that have that style of tread pattern. You'll see in here, Jack Coon's boots that were taken on a search warrant has that general pattern. Interestingly though, Jack Coon's boots have a, a logo on it, Field and Stream, because it was a legitimate boot. And you'll see from the, the snow pictures, the ones out there, they didn't have that indent Field and Stream. You're gonna expect something, you know, to see something in the snow in regard to that trademark from where it's at, but nothing there. And what do we know here? That trade pattern is, that tread pattern uh, can be um, a lot of different models. It can be even counterfeited. Unfortunately, you know, by the time Mr. Olson was identified as a suspect, you know, he had plenty of time to destroy the evidence. He had plenty of time to get rid of any incriminating evidence, and he did, except for the ones that were saved electronically. The gun, and, and look through his search, look through his history. Look through the search history, that's in evidence too. And consider how, you know, you had hard testimony here about all the work they did in terms of Jack Coon. He wasn't there, he wasn't in Rose Lake. Make whatever shots you want against him. The evidence doesn't establish that he did it. The evidence establishes that Mr. Olson was a shooter here. Put all of those pieces together. Put all those pieces together. Now, did he run to Costa Rica? Oh, I don't think we can say that because Costa Rica, he was, you know, was on his mind. He was thinking about that. Maybe this pushed him over, it was time to do it, but he was thinking about it for years. Why this, he chose this particular time right after this murder, I don't know, that might be just a coincidence. But look at the, look at the searches. And look at the GPS, look at the results of the, the DNA, the science is what convicts him. The devices that we use as part of our everyday life. That's the only thing that solved this case. Thank you. morning. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for being here, taking time out of uh, your life to uh, sit in judgment of one of your fellow citizens. Um, there are some things that I want to go over with you. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Mr. Cunningham, Detective Miller. I want to thank my client for having trust in me and Mr. Beer, my co-counsel. I also want to thank the judge uh, for running a very efficient trial in this case. You're very lucky to have a judge. I try cases all over the state. You're very lucky to have a judge that runs a courtroom like Judge Schlegel does. Uh, she is going, I'm going to try to keep my cool, okay? I'm going to try to keep my cool. And I want to indicate that I don't impugn anybody's integrity. That's not what I do. I don't call people liars. 
I don't say people manufacture evidence. I don't do that. I had a judge tell me over 30 years ago that the wisdom of 12 is always greater than the wisdom of one. And so I trust that you will make certain decisions uh, in this case. But this case is not about Jack Kuhn. And your job is not to convict Jack Kuhn. You have one job that you took an oath for, and that is to sit in judgment of the evidence against Thomas Olson, or the lack of evidence against Thomas Olson. There are a couple of concepts that we went through in Void Deer. We went through the presumption of innocence. Mr. Olson pled not guilty. The judge told you and will tell you again that he is presumed to be innocent. We start that he is innocent. And that carries all the way through the trial until 12 of you go back into that jury room and decide beyond any reasonable doubt that Thomas Olson is guilty. This is what the judge, and if I even get a comma wrong or a period wrong or an inflection wrong from what the judge tells you, you listen to the judge because she's the law. But I just want to get you in the frame of mind of what you're going to be told. And what I just said is Mr. Olson is presumed to be innocent. And I'll step over here so everybody can see it. That's the law. This is what you're going to be able to take back with you. This means you must start with that presumption that he is innocent and it continues throughout the trial and entitles, entitles by law, Mr. Olson to a verdict of not guilty unless you are satisfied beyond any reasonable doubt that he is guilty. If you go down to number two, they're going to give you elements. Mr. Cunningham talked about elements. He's conceded that there's no intent to kill. He's conceded there's no intent to do great bodily harm, that whoever killed Mr. Yang was reckless. But if you find that the prosecutor has not proven every element of the case beyond a reasonable doubt, then you took an oath that you must find him not guilty. And a reasonable doubt will be defined to you as a fair, honest doubt growing out of the evidence or the lack of evidence. It's not an imaginary doubt, a possible doubt, but a doubt based on reason and common sense after careful and consideration examination of the evidence. You know, Mr. Beer, just, I'm going to have you take that down. Take, take all that. I'm, I'm not even going to put up any more exhibits for it. I'm just going to speak from the heart to you. Yes, please. Reasonable doubt. As I had steam coming out of my ears, I'm trying to figure, how do I explain reasonable doubt to you? What does it mean, reasonable doubt? Beyond any doubt, if that doubt is reasonable. If it's one doubt, if it's two doubts, if it's five doubts, if it's 10 doubts, if you have different doubts, if you have one doubt about this case, one doubt, and that doubt is reasonable and not imaginary, not a gremlin, the case is over. You don't have to solve this case. You are not the detective, Detective Miller, is. You are not the prosecutor, Mr. Cunningham is. You are not the defense attorneys, Mr. Beer and I are. You are only here to decide, is there a doubt? You may have different doubts, but if all of you go back and say, do I have a doubt that Mr. Olson is guilty? One doubt? And that doubt is not some imaginary doubt, but a doubt based on the evidence or lack of evidence. Stop. 
your job is done. There'll be another jury that'll decide whether or not anybody else may be guilty. There'll be other prosecutors who may take another look at this evidence. There'll be another detective that may reopen the case and look at some of the questions that we brought up. It is not your job. So what is a reasonable doubt? Well, I have a little story. I lost my mom a few months ago. And prior to that, she trusted me to make her medical decisions. So we filled out these forms, durable medical power of attorney. And we trusted you to make this decision. We picked you, all of you. We went through your background. We asked you questions. And we trusted you. We gave you an oath. I had to sign something. And that said, I accepted that trust my mother gave me. And so when things became out of her control health-wise, I had that same burden that you have right now. I had to weigh evidence what doctors were telling me. Just like Mr. Olson doesn't have the control to make the decision, you have to make it. So I thought to myself, okay, when I'm listening to different doctors tell me different things, quite frankly, the nurses seem to know a lot more than the doctors did. Uh, sometimes the doctors needed to stay in their own lane. They were an expert in everything. But I kind of used it before I made a medical decision on what would cause me to hesitate what would cause me to hesitate before I made that decision on behalf of my mother who was unable to make that decision? So I ask you maybe to think about the job I had and how intense it was and analogize it to the job you have and how intense it is. You don't want to screw up that decision. You want it to be beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence, based on what the doctors tell you, what the nurses tell you, what the tests come back as. And then you put it all together, and if you have a doubt, you get a second opinion. You have another test done on that case. So I said, you know, that is kind of the frame of mind I'd ask you to consider and take this case as seriously as you would if you had to make that important decision for somebody that you care about. Now, you don't know Mr. Olson. You don't know Mr. Olson, but the gravity of the decision is the same as if you were doing it for a loved one, the gravity of this decision. So then you have to say, OK, and again, if I say that an argument is intellectually dishonest. I am not impugning anybody being dishonest. If I say that evidence lacks credibility, I'm not saying somebody is not credible. That's up to you. I'm not trying to personalize this in any way. But the burden of proof is on the prosecution. I didn't have to prove anything in this case, not one thing. I could have sat on my hands and just sat back and watched Mr. Cunningham put on a show. This was his show. The reason the defense has letters, prosecution has numbers, is because they usually put in the evidence. They've got exhibit one and exhibit two. We had to put in the evidence just so you could have a logical understanding of what happened. But for us putting in that evidence, you wouldn't have known or been able to visualize or see anything. And I don't want you to feel that if something was missed, Manly or Beer would have had it. 
or they would have put it in because we didn't have to put in anything. But it's not fair to you to not understand the position of Mr. Yang's body, the two logs that became important, the footprints, the trail, the whiteboard, all those types of things, the state police, GPS that showed the red and the green dots, all those things you wouldn't have been able to visualize with just text messages. I shot the sheriff, okay? You all said you needed more than that. So we brought you the evidence, even though we didn't have to. A through Z, double A through Z, into the Bs and a lot of BS that has been given. That's probably the biggest exhibit in this case, is exhibit BS, because there is zero evidence linking Mr. Olson to this crime. There is no eyewitness, none, that says Mr. Olson did this. There is zero DNA that links Mr. Olson to this crime, even though the argument is DNA was on deer spray hundreds of yards, three to 400 yards away to the southwest. You had unidentified DNA on his vest. You had unidentified DNA on his jacket. Mr. Olson was excluded from every single thing. And the only question, and see, that's about the fairness of this, OK? Because next time it might be me on trial. It might be you. It might be one of your loved ones. It might be somebody sitting on this side. It might be somebody sitting on this side. It's about fairness and asking the questions and knowing that not every case has perfect evidence. But you want to be fair to the jury. But when you only ask one question of Mr. Delu, the DNA expert, and says, yes, the deer spray connects to Mr. Olson, if I didn't ask about the 21 other tests that were done, including the vest and the jacket of Mr. Yang that had unidentified DNA that excluded Mr. Olson or no evidence could be linked to Mr. Olson or Mr. Rodway or Mr. Yang, and then they don't test Jack Coons? They don't test? What if Jack Coons' DNA is on his vest? That's for another jury. That's for another detective. That's for another prosecutor. That's for another day. But this family is a good family, and they deserve justice. Justice is not convicting the wrong person. They deserve the best investigation. They deserve the best prosecution. And they deserve answers. That's what they deserve. That's what Mr. Olson deserves in this case. Zero ballistics in this case. Zero. Now, we did it. First time the detective ever saw the ballistics was when we showed it to him. How was he supposed to do his job if the attorneys who are running the case, and attorneys run the cases, OK? He was a brand new detective. He had one year out, first murder case. Attorneys have to direct the investigation. That's what we do. This is missing. Check on this. Double check this. I need answers here. And this young man got no direction whatsoever. We had great respect with each other. He was right there when we were out at the scene. We talked about the ballistics. And again, these aren't plastic heads. These aren't plastic heads. We talked about these are sophisticated ballistic dummy heads. 
he saw it for the first time of what a 12 gauge shotgun, I thought of, unfortunately, it reminded me of President Kennedy in the Zapruder film. I think I must object. There's no testimony in this case as to the ballistics or how the results of the... I'm not going to get into the results, Your Honor. I think you'll see where I'm going in its argument. The evidence is in the case because he watched that. He watched what we put up there. And his answer was, had they given this to me, it was so important that I would have gone to the Michigan State Police Crime Lab or I would have gone to Quantico, Virginia and had it tested to determine if you are correct or to be able to get up and have Mr. Cunningham say, what I just saw was nonsense. And he didn't even get the opportunity to do that. Never got the opportunity to what he saw to test and give us an answer of whether or not a muzzle loader causes a one centimeter by one centimeter wound or a 12 gauge shotgun from 52 feet causes a one, one by one centimeter wound. Uh, again, I must object, there's no such evidence in terms of... Uh... What part? What part about uh, the weapons and what they would cause? Uh, exactly. Exactly. What I'm the saying is there's no have, evidence. The only evidence we have in the case is that a medical examiner saying you can't tell. Right, and you'll be allowed to address that in your rebuttal. I am not hearing Mr. Manley say that was evidence. What I heard him say was that um, when questioning the sergeant, that he indicated what he would do had he seen the video. Yes, but going into it, Going into the specifics, he, there was never any testimony about one inch or two inch. Or there was by the medical examiner. There's an exhibit with a one centimeter by one centimeter picture of the wound. Left occipital skull through the left eye. Thank you, Your Honor. So what we have are three things that you have to look at in this case, and I ask you to look at. The first thing is we have the boot prints of the killer. We have the boot prints of the killer. We had to show you the evidence so you understand it. But you saw it on the whiteboard that Detective Miller did at 4 a.m. that morning, and he showed you exactly that there were no other boot prints with two inches of fresh snow and those were, ended up being field and stream swamp tracker boots, okay? No other person, no other boot print was behind Mr. Yang when he got shot in the left occipital scalp area, the skull area, and came out his eye. The only other prints were Mr. Yang's, okay? I believe my learned brother counsel is mistaken when he says that there was no evidence that the boots that Mr. Olson was wearing were not the boots on that day. And he was bringing up a different picture. You saw into evidence two pictures, two pictures taken on that day up there with the field it had a date stamp and a time stamp, and I'm not gonna go through every one because you guys took notes the whole time, but there were two pictures that they had retrieved that showed on November 16th, 2018, the top of the boot. You knew exactly what boot he was wearing on the 16th. So to say we didn't know what boot he was wearing is mistaken. It's mistaken. It says 11-16-2018, and in my opening I said, that picture might have saved his life, given the arguments that are being made. That picture may have saved his life. 
The second picture was the gun. And we stipulated that Mr. Riley gave him a 12-gauge Remington shotgun. We stipulated a fact that was told to the jury, so you may take that as fact. The judge will tell you about that. We also know, besides no other boot prints, that the FBI said the boot print that Mr. Olson had is not a Field and Stream Swamp Tracker boot. It's not. Cleared by Quantico, Virginia. Doubt. Changed his boots in between the picture and in the dark in the shooting? Unlikely. Doubt. Michigan State Police Crime Lab took what you saw that was admitted into evidence, Officer Decker, Sergeant Nichols from DNR, and Detective Miller. You saw the video in opening and it was admitted. They were following the tracks. And when they were following the tracks, they knew the print was like Meng Yang's, but Meng Yang had a size 14. And Decker says, and he was unavailable, so we agreed that you could see that video and that would be admitted into evidence, said, we got lucky. We got lucky. And I wear a size 11, 11 and a half, I can't remember exactly, and it's just a little bit bigger, but we got the brand, we got the model. And then they send it off to the Michigan State Police Crime Lab. They send it off. But they take pictures of it that night and the next morning. So on the 16th and the 17th, you have pictures of the only boot prints behind Mr. Yang, the boot prints of the killer. A couple of things that you really need to think about. Very clear that this is not evidence. Okay, these are tips. These are tips. They are not evidence of what was said. But they got tips that needed to be followed up on, on Jack Coon. Okay? You say there's no evidence against Jack Coon. Jack Coon was cleared. Why don't you bring Tyler Bachman and Mr. Slesser up on the stand and let a different jury say what Mr. Coon said? Jack Coon is supposedly cleared. Let's have another trial and bring Mr. Conroy up and see what he has to say. Or Mr. Holliday and see what that jury would have to say. These people, Mr. Glover from Home Depot, what he has to say about all of Jack Coon being involved in this case. It's not your job to decide whether or not Mr. Coon did it. But do you have a doubt with the evidence of Mr. Kuhn? Detective Miller testified on the 18th he came back. And those same boot prints were the only other boot prints that were there. And they were not there on the 16th. They were not there on the 17th, but they were there on the 18th. And on the 20th, Sergeant Nichols puts out a be on the lookout for these boots. So we have the boot prints of the killer that are not linked. I'm sorry, but this was an intentional murder in cold blood of this man, this family's loved one. This man, according to Detective Miller's testimony, where the boot prints were by the log, were 52 feet away. Sergeant Rogers came in with the state police uniform to the centimeter. You didn't see any boot prints, Mr. Cunningham asked him. Oh, yes, I did. Put the pole right where the boot prints were, and you'll see exactly where those boot prints went. There is zero link to Mr. Olson of the boot prints of the killer. Zero. None. We know what boots he was wearing, and he was cleared by the FBI crime lab of it. We also know on the 19th of January that Detective Miller and Chief Smith go out and take Mr. Kuhn out to the scene. 
Tells him he wears lacrosse boots. Tells him he wears a different style of boot. But the biggest thing Detective Miller testified to is he said, to get to my stand, Jack Coon's stand, there's only one way in and one way out. And that is to go by where Mr. Yang was killed. He also testified on the 16th that he went and bought a new tree stand, assembled it, and took it back the next day. Now, reasonable inference can be maybe he didn't go out to hunt, maybe he got a new tree stand, he wanted to get it up the night before for an early hunt the next morning. We don't know. But why do you buy a tree stand, then you go, assemble it, and then you just take it back the next day? That's what they followed up on. Dick Sporting Goods. We know he bought the tree stand. What they didn't follow up was his alibi at Meyer. They didn't follow up on that. They didn't follow up on Speedway. And they didn't follow up on Huntington Bank. They didn't even try. Can't just get up there and say, well, they wouldn't have had the video. You got to try. And you don't need, and, and the reason the pictures, sometimes you do need to call the crime lab or the Michigan State Police, the response team that come out there to make sure you get the right pictures at the right angle. But I don't know if you really needed an expert to tell you if Mr. Kuhn's boot prints matched the ones that were north. And he admitted that he hunted on the 18th. And we have a text telling his wife, and we can argue what that text means. Reasonable minds can differ on that and hunting tonight. But that's for a different jury. But the boot prints of the killer, which we know where he was shot from, no evidence as it relates to Mr. Olson. So if you have one doubt about whether you can link the boot prints of the killer when you go back into the jury room, stop. You don't have to solve this crime. It's not your job. We'll get the case moving again. The message will be continue to do your job. Continue to investigate. Check the DNA. There's still unidentified DNA. We didn't hear any evidence. You could, you don't even need Mr. Kuhn to voluntarily give DNA. You can go to Ancestry.com now and find out who's DNA. And trust me, they've got big banks of DNA samples, but they didn't even test Mr. Kuhn's on that vest and on that jacket. But there is no evidence whatsoever at all that Mr. Olson has the boot prints of the killer. In fact, I think it absolutely clears Mr. Olson of being the person behind Mr. Yang. The second part, besides the boot prints of the killer, is the GPS. <coughs> It's the only thing I'm not gonna, it's the only thing I'm gonna show you, okay? Only thing. Now I give FBI agent Rashke credit and I give the prosecution credit of not bringing in the other one that Detective Miller said he only saw two days before the preliminary exam. I give him credit for not bringing in that exhibit. And I had to, come out like a, a manager in baseball and yank my pitcher at that point in time because there is no other evidence that has been brought in besides this. Okay? This is the body. I finally get to use this. I've been trying to... There's the body. Right there. Okay, this is the evidence when he comes in, where 
he goes. Where is the evidence that shows any GPS that Mr. Olson was here? Zero. Zero. Is that a doubt? Now, a reasonable inference that there's a time gap? Are you kidding? That's a guess. That's a fantasy. That's the evidence right there. So we have the boot prints of the killer that aren't linked to Mr. Olson. And just this simple. There is no eyewitness. And he keeps bringing up the phone. Well, I think the phone saved his life. Because this phone picked up besides a, what, a 13 minute gap? That he's gonna, what, go from here through dense woods or backtrack over here and come back? Zero evidence that Mr. Olson was near that body. Zero. If that's a doubt, case over. You've done your job. Right there. Case over. No eyewitnesses. No evidence putting him there. None. Those text messages, again, we put in ones that said he didn't do it, he was going to cooperate, he's going to sue the police, blah, blah, blah. They put in some jokes. Where they're wrong is Mr. Olson did not send that picture. Mr. Rodway sent that picture to Mr. Olson. And it wasn't funny. It's not. But there is your lack of evidence right there. We have no exact time of the gunshot. So even if this gap he talks about in here, Mr. Feaster, Mr. Graham, they indicate a roundabout time. But something that's really interesting is Mr. Dembinski. He sees something weird about 9 to 9.15. Says it twice. Said he testified to it before. Says he sees somebody walking along Clark Road around 9, 9.15, and one of them's wearing tennis shoes, which is odd, and another one has two guns, maybe inferring that somebody went back, picked up Mr. Yang's gun, and took it out of that area. I don't know. It's not my job to prove anything, but it's unexplained. You can argue with him, but he said 9 to 9.15. You can say, well, maybe it was sunset. He was pretty sure each time. I want to call out the credibility of the argument that the prosecution has made that footprints came from the body and went right where the field spray was. And if you remember, the field spray was right where the arrow ended, right there, which makes sense because McPherson talks about he follows footprints. But let's go back and you can check your notes. McPherson never went to the body. Never. Detective Sergeant McPherson testified he got a call. He went to Bath Township between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. He had that meeting with all the other detectives. And he said, I can't remember if I was shown a picture of the boot I was looking for or if somebody, once I got there, pointed and said, yeah, it's something like this. But he also said, I was looking for a gun and a backpack and things that may have been missing. But he said he never went to the body. He never got to the body. He said the body was three to 400 yards away. Initially, he said two to 300. I said in your last testimony, you said three to 400. Would that be accurate? And he was doing his best to guess. He didn't have an exact, but this is where he found the deer spray, right there. He had never gone to the body, so an argument that has been put forth to you that boot prints were followed exactly to where that deer spray is not true. It's not true. They even showed 
and redirect the boot prints that came from the crime lab? Are these the boot prints you were looking for? And Detective Sergeant McPherson said, I, I don't remember. But sometimes actions speak louder than words, right? Actions speak louder than words. You can say something, but sometimes you don't watch the lips, you watch the feet. What's real important with McPherson? Long time, 20 plus years, detective sergeant. What's real important about McPherson? Now, the biggest part of their case is he says McPherson followed tracks right from the body and went right to the deer spray that has Mr. Olson. It's not true. Check your notes, it's not true. It's not a long trial. You, ever, you can remember what, what he said. He never got to the body. Body was three, 400 yards away. But if you look at his actions, and they say this is the biggest part of their case, yet a 20 year detective pick it up, look at it, and drop it, and left it there. That tells you, in his mind, through his actions, what he thought of that evidence. Now later it did turn out that it's right along the path of where Mr. Olson was going. He passed this. Is he supposed to have gone up and then back down in deep woods? Shot from where? Unintentional, a joke? You saw that wound. 52 feet away, there were another set of footprints that went back and forth. This was an execution. This wasn't a joke. It was an execution of Mr. Yang not funny, it wasn't a joke, it had nothing to do with that. Most likely it had something to do with either a hate crime, and there's evidence that needs to be looked at on who may have had a motive for a hate crime, or it's just two hunters fighting over where they should be hunting. But it's not true. You see the path where the arrows are, and there's absolutely no evidence and McPherson's actions, he dropped it. No other DNA near the body, no footprints near the body, and again, not identified. Laser, laser. Yeah, they get the geofence, but they stopped the geofence at eight, so we don't know who the two people were, but all those unidentified devices up in this area. Yeah, there could have been houses north, but there are no houses in the Rose Lake State game area, none. Nice man, I'm gonna wish him well at his retirement, but he got the search warrant wrong, put the wrong date on the first time. And when you only look at three devices or you pull out three devices, and you make decisions, mistakes happen. There were devices, he said, in this area, wherever they were. Mr. Beer fired right through those things with Cell Hawk and got him to admit that devices were not tested. What if one of those is Jack Coons? What if one of them is Jack Coons? What if the DNA is Jack Coons? What if they go get the muzzle loader and they do the ballistic testing and it's Jack Coons? It's not your job, but when you bring a case, you have to bring it beyond a reasonable doubt. The third thing and the final thing are the ballistics. Dr. Wilson did the autopsy. We have ballistics that it's a one by one centimeter. He talked about plastic heads, but unfortunately, you only know what Detective Miller knows. You got to see a clip, just like he got to see a clip. Unfortunately, when we're working together and he doesn't get what he needs to finish his investigation, you can't blame it on him. You can't throw him under the bus for every mistake that's been made. He's the officer in charge collecting, but he needs direction. And he didn't get his direction in this case. He didn't even get a chance to take what you saw 
and take it to a crime lab to verify or to rebut. But what if that missing piece of evidence now links up to a 50 caliber Thompson Center muzzle? What if? That's for another jury to decide. It's not for you to decide. All you have to say is there one doubt on this case. Mr. Riley's gun was never tested. We have metallurgy that the FBI had. And what I want you to do is ask yourself if you were put in the position that I had to be put in for my mother and I had to make an important life decision on whether or not somebody lives or dies, whether or not you need more evidence, you need more testing done to make that important life decision. If Dr. Cunningham came in and gave you those arguments that he gave based on the evidence that was shown, would you have a doubt with Dr. Cunningham that these could be knockoff boots from China, that he could have changed his boots, that there's some gap that we don't have a circle, we have zero ballistics, no eyewitness, we didn't check DNA, you'd say, no, Dr. Cunningham, I think you need to run more tests before I make an important life decision like this. What about Dr. Miller? Dr. Miller, not following through with things, he, came, he comes to you and he says, I want you to make this important life decision. And here's all the evidence that I have. But I didn't do these tests. Well, you know what, Dr. Miller? You seem like a good guy, you're a little inexperienced. That's no shame in that. But why don't you go run those other tests before I make this important life decision? Because it's just not enough. What I'm asking you to do, and you're going to get a verdict form, and count one, the judge is going to tell you, you can only pick one not guilty, guilty of felony murder, guilty of second degree murder. I don't know what his argument is. I don't know if he shot up in the air and a magic bullet came around. I, I really don't understand what the prosecution's argument is. But we're gonna ask you to put not guilty on that because they didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And using a firearm during the commission of a felony, there's no evidence that the gun that he had put a one centimeter by one centimeter and that count two relates to if he is convicted of one of these others. But what this case comes down to is one doubt. One doubt. And your only job is not whether Kuhn did it, not whether Manley proved anything or Beer proved anything. It's did Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Miller prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Thomas Olson murdered Mr. Yang. What a verdict of not guilty will do was, would, will tell the prosecution to keep working for this nice family, to keep working to find the truth, to keep working to answer these unanswered questions, to find out whose DNA was on his vest, to do the ballistic testing, to do the other devices that were in this area. You can send another geofence. They could put a geofence right around there if they wanted to. The message needs to be sent, and it needs to be sent strongly to the government. Because you are the guardrails to the government getting out of control and convicting somebody with no evidence whatsoever. Text messages, jokes. They weren't even funny. And when it started to get serious, they're like, hey, we need to tell the truth, cooperate. Detective Miller read it and said, hey, don't worry. They're going to do ballistics. It'll clear us. Well, we're fine. And then they don't do ballistics. And here we are. So your message of not guilty 
And I'm asking, send it. Send the message that there's a doubt. It, you don't have to share the same doubt. But go around when you get in there. Do you have a doubt? 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 All the way around. I have a doubt. It, stop. It's over. One doubt. And if that doubt's reasonable, this case is over. So I'm asking you to find Thomas Olson not guilty, and I'm asking you to send a message to the prosecution and to law enforcement to get answers for this wonderful family that's out there who lost tragically Chong, Li, Chong Yang. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> You know, the uh, time that I addressed you, I didn't know what counsel was going to say. Uh, when he got up, he had already heard me. So now I have the chance to rebut some of the things he said. It just makes sense. I'm not going to raise anything new. I'm just going to address those matters that he addressed, to rebut those matters. Now, first of all, a not guilty verdict doesn't send any messages because the evidence shows there's a right guy here and it's over and nobody's going to arrest Jack Coon because the evidence shows that he didn't do it. It's all misdirection here. To argue things about Coon, argue all you want. The evidence doesn't support it. They did the work, they pounded, they got his, his, uh, his cell phone, not from Google, but from iPhone. And you heard testimony to that. They used that. Well, obviously, you see that he's got the um, text messages from Kuhn. Uh, how do you get text messages? You get the phone records. Of course they got phone records. To sit here and say we didn't get phone records from Jack Kuhn is uh, clearly a misstatement. To say that the phone, the boot print was taken, uh, at the time of the crime, there is, and you will see it, a shot of a boot taken at uh, Friday, November 16, 2008, at 4.23 p.m. And this is on Mr. Olson's phone. That boot was never identified by the VA, by the um, defense. They just couldn't do it. The FBI just could not identify who that one was. The cold-blooded killers revisiting the scene, that's the one the report's about. But the one taken at the time, you can see a boot sticking up. Nobody identified that. He was never clear. There was no indication. Now, to say that the boot prints are not linked is a misstatement. The boot prints are clearly linked to Mr. Olson. The boot prints come around down the main path and then go off to the west. No matter what he says the testimony was, they went off to the west. At the end of the track, there was the bag with Mr. Olson's DNA, and then the tracks go back to the main path. That, more than anything, links him to that boot with the tread pattern. Now, we've seen that tread pattern everywhere. We've seen that tread pad <clears throat> when the execution of search warrants. We've seen Kuhn with that tread pad. We've seen Meng Ying with that tread pad. <coughs> but we only see one bit of evidence that links to that tread pad through DNA, and that is the DNA of Thomas Olson on that deer spray <laughs> and on that, um, that bag. So to say that there's nothing that links the blueprints to Olson is a misstatement. Clearly, those blueprints are linked to him by his DNA. Now, arguments are made that the ballistics were never shown to the officer, and he could have tracked it down. Ballistics. You heard testimony from the officer that he turned over 
the results of his investigation to the attorney general and to the prosecutor, okay? At that point in time, it's up to the prosecutors to direct the case. To have some indication of some off-the-wall demonstration that scientifically unreliable would not be something to be, to be um, followed up on. How do we know it's scientifically not reliable? Dr. Wilson. Now, Dr. Wilson, you heard her testimony. Went through college, went through medical school, had a internship, had a residency, had the background, and she says there's no way in the world you can tell whether what kind of caliber uh, made that uh, that hole. Uh, you know, you can discern if it was like a 22, a very small one, or if it was a, a cannonball. But anything in between, you're not going to be able to tell from a quote demonstration. You know, by shooting at a plastic head. I think that's what her discussion there. So to say that it was not shown to the officer, of course it wasn't shown to the officer. We're not going to tell the officer to go out there and do waste time and effort and resources because of something that's not scientifically unreliable? Misdirection. Misdirection. Clearly, clearly, the evidence here shows that Mr. Olson was out there Mr. Olson did not come forward until he, you know, several years later when, when he was identified through the records. He did not volunteer any information. Counsel indicates that this was an execution. He may know things I don't. I don't know. I have no evidence here or see no evidence of an execution. What I see evidence of is somebody getting carried away with a joke because that's the frat boy mentality that we see throughout the entire comments on this phone, on this cell phone. So yes, think about the, the evidence in the case. Don't think about uh, whether it's, you, you want the responsibility of having a, uh, to, to make a decision on your your mother's uh, health care, that's uh, not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is looking at this evidence and considering the fact that he is there, he is at the scene, he's within rifle distance of him, and his DNA is found on some evidence that go right from the footprints right from the scene. That's what's important. Think about that. Think about it and realize that that does prove beyond the reasonable doubt. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we're going to take a break. Um, as you see, I'm having a little difficulty with coughing. I apologize to counsel. My intent was certainly not to ever disrupt anyone. But we're going to take a break so I can go cough and drink some water. Give you an opportunity to also take a break. And then when you come back, um, then we'll proceed from there. So at this time, I'd like all to rise for the jury, please.
I'm going to go to the back and see if you're not getting any, any hint of jury and gotcha. Your office did. Okay, thank you. So, sorry, yeah, that back wall. Yep. Just so we're not no, absolutely. I just wanted, no. That's why I came up before I started saying yeah, that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I was coming back to tell you no. <coughs>
requesting to direct a verdict of acquittal on the charges on the charged offenses against Mr. Olson. A directed verdict of acquittal is appropriate only if considering all the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, no rational trier of fact could find that the essential elements of the crime charge were proved beyond were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. This is pursuant to people v. Mihal 454-16-1997. The court looks to see whether the evidence presented, viewed in the light most favorable to the prosecution, could have persuaded a rational trier of fact that the essential elements of the crime charge were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. This is pursuant to People v. Aldridge, 246-101-122-2001. In looking at evidence and the definition of evidence, this court is a huge fan of looking at Black's Law Dictionary to take definitions. Circumstantial evidence, well actually let me start with direct evidence. Direct evidence <clears throat> has a very lengthy definition, but in part evidence which if believed proves existence of fact and issue without inference or presumption. Looking at circumstantial evidence, testimony not based on actual, actual personal knowledge or observation of the facts in controversy, but of other facts from which deductions are drawn, showing indirectly the facts sought to be proved. This court found that evidence, both direct and circumstantial, were provided to the jury. In looking at the evidence presented without weighing the credibility of that evidence, because that is not this court's responsibility to decide whether or not or who, which evidence was credible, which was not, that is not the responsibility of this court. So in looking at the evidence that was presented without weighing the credibility of that evidence, this court <coughs> heard, presented, Mr. Yang was shot while in Rose Lake, the state property hunting grounds, on November 16, 2018. Mr. Olson's phone shows he was also in Rose Lake on November 16, 2018. He had a gun. A bag with deer spray that had Mr. Olson's DNA was found. Several text messages were on Mr. Olson's phone and indicated derogatory statements toward Asians and minority groups as a whole. Another message on the phone indicated two cold-blooded killers were visiting the scene of the crime. And there was a picture of him and Mr. Rodway standing, I believe, near a photo of Mr. that Mr. Yang's family had put up with a reward for information. Google searches on Mr. Olson's phone regarding the murder of Mr. Yang. The testimony was that this was prior to the release to the public of the murder. Testimony of Mr. Yang's gun and knife missing. Testimony that two men were seen, one was carrying two guns. For those reasons, I find that in the light most favorable to the prosecution, the evidence could have persuaded a rational trial of fact that the essential elements of the crime charge were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And so for that reason, I am going to deny the defense motion for directive verdict. At this point, unless there's anything else that I need to address with the people or the defense, I will be bringing in the jury to read uh, the instructions. Mr. Cunningham. Nothing from the people, Your Honor, ready for instructions. Mm -hmm. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. <coughs> we are ready for the jury then. <coughs> All rise for the jury.
jury. Members of the jury, the evidence and arguments in this case are finished, and I will now instruct you on the law. That is, I will explain the law that applies to this case. Remember that you have taken an oath to return a true and just verdict based only on the evidence and my instructions on the law. You must not let sympathy or prejudice influence your decision. As jurors, you must decide what the facts of this case are. This is your job and nobody else's. You must think about all the evidence and then decide what each piece of evidence means and how important you think it is. This includes whether you believe what each of the witnesses said. What you decide about any fact in this case is final. It is my duty to instruct you on the law. You must take the law as I give it to you. If a lawyer says something different about the law, follow what I say. At various times, I have already given you some instructions about the law. You must take all my instructions together as a law you are to follow. You should not pay attention to some instructions and ignore others. To sum up, it is your job to decide what the facts of the case are, to apply the law, to apply the law as I give it to you, and in that way, to decide the case. <coughs> A person accused of a crime is presumed to be innocent. This means that you must start with the presumption that the defendant is innocent. This presumption continues throughout the trial and entitles the defendant to a verdict of not guilty unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty. Every crime is made up of parts called elements. The prosecutor must prove each element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant is not required to prove his innocence or to do anything. If you find that the prosecutor has not proven every element beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. A reasonable doubt is a fair, honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. It is not merely an imaginary or possible doubt, but a doubt based on reason and common sense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that is reasonable after a careful and considered examination of the facts and circumstances of this case. Every defendant has the absolute right not to testify. When you decide the case, you must not consider the fact that he did not testify. It must not affect your verdict in any way. When you discuss the case and decide on your verdict, you may only consider the evidence that has been properly admitted in this case. Therefore, it is important for you to understand what is evidence and what is not evidence. Evidence includes only the sworn testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits admitted into trial, and anything else I told you to consider. Many things are not evidence, and you must be careful not to consider them as such. I will now describe some of the things that are not evidence. The fact that the defendant is charged with a crime and is on trial is not evidence. Likewise, the fact that he is charged with more than one crime is not evidence. The lawyer's statements and arguments and any commentary are not evidence. They are only meant to help you understand the evidence and each side's legal theories. You should only accept things the lawyers say that are supported by the evidence or by your own common sense and general knowledge. The lawyer's questions to the witnesses are not evidence. You should consider these questions only as they give meaning to the witnesses' answers. 
My comments, rulings, questions, and instructions are also not evidence. It is my duty to see that the trial is conducted according to the law and to tell you the law that applies to this case. However, when I make a comment or give an instruction, I am not trying to influence your vote or express an, a personal opinion about the case. If you believe that I have an opinion about how you should decide this case, you must pay no attention to that opinion. You are the only judges of the facts, and you should decide this case from the evidence. At times during the trial, I have excluded evidence that was offered or stricken testimony that was heard. Do not consider those things in deciding the case. Make your decision only on the evidence that I let in and nothing else. Your decision should be based on all the evidence, regardless of which party produced it. You should use your own common sense and general knowledge in weighing and judging the evidence, but you should not use any personal knowledge you may have about a place, person, or event. To repeat once more, you must decide this case based only on the evidence admitted during this trial. As I said before, it is your job to decide what the facts of this case are. You must decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think their testimony is. You do not have to accept or reject anything a witness said. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. However, in deciding whether you believe a witness's testimony, you must set aside any bias or prejudice you may have based on the race, gender, or national origin of the witness. There are no fixed set of rules for judging whether you believe a witness, but it may help you to think about these questions. Was the witness able to see or hear clearly? How long was the witness watching or listening? Was anything else going on that might have distracted the witness? Did the witness seem to have a good memory? How did the witness look and act while testifying? Did the witness seem to be making an honest effort to tell the truth, or did the witness seem to evade the questions or, or argue with the lawyers? Does the witness, witness's age and maturity affect how you judge his or her testimony? Does the witness have any bias, prejudice, or personal interest in how this case is decided? Have there been any promises, threats, suggestions, or other influences that affected how the witness testified? In general, does the witness have any special reason to tell the truth or any special reason to lie? All in all, how reasonable does the witness's testimony seem when you think about all the other evidence in the case? Sometimes the testimony of different witnesses will not agree, and you must decide which testimony you accept. You should think about whether the disagreement involves something important or not, whether you think that someone is lying or is simply mistaken. People see and hear things differently, and witnesses may testify honestly, but simply be wrong about what they thought they saw or remember. It is also a good idea to think about which testimony agrees best with the other evidence in the case. However, you may conclude that a witness deliberately lied about something that is important to how you decide the case. If so, you may choose not to accept anything that witness said. On the other hand, if you think the witness lied about some things but told the truth about others, you may simply accept the part you think is true and ignore the rest. The prosecutor must also prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime occurred on or about November 16, 2018, within Clinton County. When you go to the jury room, you will be provided with a written copy of the final jury instructions. You should first choose a foreperson. The foreperson should see to it that your discussions are carried on in a business-like way and that everyone has a fair chance to be heard. During your deliberations, please turn off your cell phones and other communication equipment until we recess. A verdict in a criminal case must be unanimous. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each of you agree on that verdict. In the jury room, you will discuss the case among yourselves, but ultimately, each of you will have to make up your own mind. Any verdict must represent the individual considered judgment of each juror. It is your duty as jurors to talk to each other and make every reasonable effort to reach an agreement. Express your opinions and the reasons for them, but keep an open mind as you listen to your fellow jurors. Rethink your opinions. Do not hesitate to change your mind if you decide you are wrong. 
try your best to work out your differences. However, although you should try to reach an agreement, none of you should give up, give up your honest opinion about the case just because the other jurors disagree with you or just for the sake of reaching a verdict. In the end, your vote must be your own and you must vote honestly and in good conscience. If you have any questions about the jury instructions before you begin deliberations or questions about the instructions that arise during deliberations, you may submit them in writing in a sealed envelope to the bailiff. Possible penalty should not influence your decision. It is the duty of the judge to fix the penalty within the limits provided by the law. If you want to communicate with me while you are in the jury room, please have your foreperson write a note and give it to the bailiff. It is not proper for you to talk directly with the judge, lawyers, court officers, or other people involved in the case. As you discuss the case, you must not let anyone, even me, know how your voting stands. Therefore, until you return with a unanimous verdict, do not reveal this to anyone outside the jury room. go to the jury room to deliberate, you may take your notes and full instructions. We will also be sending the exhibits back to uh, the jury room with you as you deliberate. When you go to the jury room, you will be given a written copy of the instructions you have just heard. As you discuss the case, you should think about all my instructions together as the law you are to follow. defendant is charged with two counts, that is, with the crimes of first degree felony murder or the less serious crime of second degree murder and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. These are separate crimes and the prosecutor is charging that the defendant committed both of them. You must consider each crime separately in light of all the evidence in the case. You may find the defendant guilty of all or any one of these crimes guilty of a less serious crime or not guilty. The prosecution has introduced evidence of a statement that it claims the defendant made. Before you may consider such an out-of-court statement against the defendant, you must first find that the defendant actually made the statement as given to you. If you find that the defendant did make the statement, you may give the statement whatever weight you think it deserves. In deciding this, you should think about how and when the statement was made, and about all the other evidence in the case. Facts can be proved by direct evidence from a witness or exhibit. Direct evidence is evidence about what we actually see or hear. For example, if you look outside and see rain falling, that is direct evidence that it is raining. Facts can also be proved by indirect or circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that normally or reasonably leads to other facts. So for example, if you see a person come in from outside wearing a raincoat covered with small drops of water, that would be circumstantial evidence that it is raining. You may consider circumstantial evidence, circumstantial evidence by itself, or a combination of circumstantial evidence and direct evidence can be used to prove the elements of a crime. In other words, you should consider all the evidence that you believe There has been some evidence that the defendant fled after the alleged crime. This evidence does not prove guilt. A person may run or hide for innocent reasons, such as panic, mistake, or fear. However, a person may also run or hide because of a consciousness of guilt. You must decide whether the evidence is true, and if true, whether it shows that the defendant had a guilty state of mind. You have heard evidence that before the trial, a witness witnesses made a statement, statements that may be inconsistent with their testimony here in court. You may consider an inconsistent statement made before the trial only to help you decide how believable the witness witnesses testimony was when testifying here in court. If the earlier statement was made under oath, then you may also consider the earlier statement as evidence of the truth of whatever the witness witnesses said in the earlier statement when determining the facts of the case. When the lawyers agree on a statement, 
on a statement of facts. These are called stipulated facts. You may regard such stipulated facts as true, but you are not required to do so. You may consider whether the defendant had a reason to commit the alleged crime, but a reason by itself is not enough to find a person guilty of a crime. The prosecutor does not have to prove that the defendant had a reason to commit the alleged crime. He only has to show that the defendant actually committed the crime and that he meant to do so. The defendant's intent may be proved by what he said, what he did, how he did it, or by any other facts and circumstances in evidence. You should not decide this case based on which side presented more witnesses. Instead, you should think about each witness and each piece of evidence and whether you believe them. Then you must decide whether the testimony and evidence you believe proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. You have heard that a lawyer or lawyer's representative talked to one of the witnesses. There is nothing wrong with this. A lawyer or lawyer's representative may talk to a witness to find out what the witness knows about the case and what the witness's testimony will be. <clears throat> you have heard testimony from witnesses. Is it Sergeant Arms? Is that what SA stands for? Counsel? Special S agent. Special agent, thank you. Thinking something else. Special Agent Joseph Rashke, who has given you his opinion as an expert in the field of cellular analysis, mapping, and analytical records tracking. Dr. A. M. Wilson, MD, who has given you her opinion as an expert in the field of forensic pathology. Kirk DeLue, who has given you his opinion as an expert in the field of forensic science, biology. Experts are allowed to give opinions in court about matters they are experts on. However, you do not have to believe an expert's opinion. Instead, you should decide whether you believe it and how important you think it is. When you decide whether your belief in experts, believe, whether you decide you believe an expert's opinion, think carefully about the reasons and facts they gave for their opinion and whether those facts are true. You should also think about the expert's qualifications and whether their opinion makes sense when you think about the other evidence in the case. You've heard testimony from witnesses who are police officers that testimony is to be judged by the same standards you use to evaluate the testimony of other witnesses. The defendant is charged with first degree felony murder. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant caused the death of Chong Yang, that is, that Chong Yang died as a result of a gunshot. Second, that the defendant had one of these three states of mind. He intended to kill, or he intended to do great bodily harm to Chong Yang, or he knowingly created a very high risk of death or great bodily harm knowing that the death or such harm would be the likely result of his actions. Third, that when he did the act that caused the death of Chong Yang, the defendant was committing or attempting to commit the crime of larceny. For the crime of larceny, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant took someone else's property. Second, that the property was taken without consent. Third, that there was some movement of the property. It does not matter whether the defendant actually kept the property or whether the property was taken off the premises. Fourth, that at the time the property was taken, the defendant intended to permanently deprive the owner of the property. Fifth, that the property had value at the time it was taken. Fourth, that the killing was not justified, excused, or done under circumstances that reduced it to a lesser crime. Second degree murder. You may also consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser serious crime of second degree murder. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant caused the death of Chong Yang. That is, that Chong Yang died as a result of a gunshot. Second, that the defendant had one of these three states of mind. He intended to kill, or he intended to do great bodily harm to Chong Yang, or he knowingly created a very high risk of death, or great bodily harm knowing that the death or such harm would be the likely result of his actions. Third, that the killing was not justified, excused, or done under circumstances that reduced it to a lesser crime. <clears throat> the defendant is also charged with a separate crime of possessing a firearm at the time he committed the crime of first degree felony murder, or the less serious crime of second degree murder. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following beyond, 
following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant committed the crime of first degree felony murder, or the less serious crime of second degree murder, which have been defined for you. It is not necessary, however, that the defendant be convicted of that crime. Second, that at the time the defendant committed the crime of first degree felony murder, or the less serious crime of second degree murder, he knowingly carried or possessed a firearm. Possession do not necessarily mean ownership. Possession means that either the person has actual physical control of the thing, as I do with the pen, with the pen that I am now holding, or the person knows the location of the firearm and has reasonable access to it. Possession may be sole, where one person alone possesses the firearm. Possession may be joint, where two or more people share possession. I have prepared a verdict form listing the possible verdicts. Possible verdicts. You may return only one verdict on each count. Mark only one verdict for each count. Count one, not guilty. Guilty of felony murder. Guilty of second degree murder. Count two, not guilty. Guilty of possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Is counsel satisfied with the court's reading of the jury instructions, Mr. Cunningham? People are satisfied, Your right? Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, at this point in time, we are going to excuse and thank our two alternate jurors. One, one. one alternate yeah. juror. I forgot. Thank you for reminding me. to keep this jury sequestered in a quiet place and not communicate with them or allow anyone to communicate with them until their verdict is returned? I do. All right. At this point in time, here in just a moment, you will be excused to the jury room to begin your deliberations and the exhibits and the verdict form and the copy of the jury instructions will be sent with you. Anything before I excuse the jury, Mr. Cunningham? Nothing, really. Anything no, thank you. Anything for you, defense? Girl. All right, at this time, all rise for the jury.
Okay, you have heard the closing arguments from both sides in the trial of Thomas Olson. He is on trial for the 2018 death of Hunter Chung Yang in Bath Township. That was on opening day of hunting season at a state park area. Our Erin um, Bowling is in the courtroom right now. She was feeding all of that back to us. She's going to have more on News 10 at 6, and she will also be on her Facebook page. Um, WILX dash Aaron Bowling with some more updates there. So make sure you check that out. She's going to have all the updates right there on her Facebook page. And of course, we will have it online at WILX.com. And we'll be back um, as soon as we hear anything else about a verdict or any other movement in this case.